Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's always a privilege to be here at pre Gallian. I think it brings together so many uh, curious uh, members of the life science community, and the brightest and uh, most innovative minds can be attracted to join the panels. So uh, today I'm very pleased to be able to uh, host a panel that actually as a title, we choose something that is a true contradiction. How can you drug something that is undruggable? And it's really meant to uh, stimulate what is the essence of being um, in science. It's to uh, look at the dogmas of uh, a certain time period and try to break them down with uh, new approaches, new technologies to make leaps in innovation. And if we bring us back maybe 15 years ago, as we started to learn increasing depth about the human genome through the sequencing efforts and a number of expressed proteins we could expect, maybe up to 20,000, looking at those that were characterized as being suitable for small molecule intervention, we figured out it could be a few thousand. So with that type of experience, making small molecule antagonist or agonist, limited ourselves to a, a few thousand of the drug targets, while many others would have been involved in disease. Um, it's so um, refreshing to see that about 10 years later, a number of technologies showed to us that that narrow mindset that we applied, uh, learning about the content of the human genome, would be um, able to change with new technologies in small molecules. One part of this was the field of targeted protein degradation. Um, and the type of molecules often are called protex, proteolysis targeted chimeras. Intriguing pioneering science, and here we have actually two of the pioneers, Craig from Yale University, also founder of Arvinas, and Alessio from um, University of Dundee that have contributed to uh, make this field open the gate to uh, dragging the undruggable with small molecules by presenting avenues in which you can create chimeras that bring together a uh, potential disease target with an enzyme that modify it and direct it to destruction in the proteasome compartment. While that opened up um, many more proteins uh, for degradation, particularly inside the cell, uh, we were still dealing with the proteome, the family of proteins in a cell. And some initial discoveries from antibiotics suggested that small molecules may even interact with RNA, led um, scientists such as uh, Jennifer CSO and founders of Arrakis, a biotech company pursuing small molecules to bind and interact at the RNA level and to um, be able to deal with mRNAs that are coding for proteins that may be involved in disease, provide an, another uh, window to how we could use small molecules for a much la larger purpose than uh, we thought initially. And uh, in some way bringing the the remit and opportunity of small molecules, which has been the backbone of, uh, of drug discovery for hundreds of years to a very large scope. Uh, pharma companies such as um, Karen representing Novartis and myself Pfizer, uh, of course were intrigued how we could deploy uh, a, a long experience in small molecules to such a new scope and thinking about end-to-end, -end, what is not just an interesting drug candidate, but how do you turn it into successful products that can be given to a large number of patients. And while we started to embark on exploring those technologies internally, many of us, of course, realized the importance of gathering together an ecosystem of innovators and collaborate to accelerate this field, and we listened to that opportunity. And finally, of course, new breakthroughs raise the questions, will we be able to innovate and increase R&D productivity? And um, uh, Michael Ringel from BCD, who is one of the thought leaders in what drives and what limits R&D productivity, will share his thoughts about um, how this field may contribute over the time to come. 
I thought we'll open up by having a question to each of the panel members. Uh, what made you feel that challenging this contradictory dogma would be a fruitful way for science drug discovery and share with us your personal um, decisions that made you put a lot of your effort into this field and your enthusiasm about it. I think I'll start with uh, Craig on the left side here. Thank you. So um, I started my own independent academic career uh, at Yale in 1995, working at the interface of chemistry and biology, uh, studying different aspects of cell biology by developing new tools, new chemical probes. And working at this intersection, uh, I got some insight into some of the challenges that the pharmaceutical industry was facing, in particular this concept of drug target space. What does it, me what does it mean to, to uh, be able to develop a, a target a drug to a particular protein? Especially in the post-genomic era, when we know every single possible drug target, where should we be deploying uh, our, our energies and our efforts, uh, and the question is how? Clearly, over the last 7,500 years, the pharmaceutical industry has made some very successful drugs using tools that were available to them, but it was also clear that new modalities, new, new strategies were going to be needed to be able to address the large fraction of the proteome that is not currently pharmaceutically vulnerable. And so as someone that studies cell biology, um, I've long been fascinated by the cellular machineries uh, inside the cell, in particular the, the system that's responsible for protein turnover, protein recycling, proteostasis, known as the ubiquitin proteasome uh, system. Uh, my first uh, company, my first drug, was a proteasome inhibitor. It's sold by Amgen today, no, known as Kyprolis. But uh, about 20 years ago, I got interested in the flip side. Instead of blocking protein recycling, could we find some way to hijack this machinery to now drag proteins to this quality control machinery, the system, and degrade those disease-causing proteins for, for clinical benefit? And so over the years in my lab and, and others, we've been able to demonstrate the feasibility of this approach. And, and I started a company called Arvinus six years ago that is now taking that uh, and is, is trying to uh, validate that in the clinic. Thank you. Alessio. Well, thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, so um, I'm a chemist by background and training, and I've always been fascinated by molecular recognition. How do molecules bind to each other? And particularly, how small molecule binds to protein, a paradigm for the pharmaceutical industry for developing drugs, particularly in, in the small molecule arena. And um, uh, I trained in fragment-based drug design, um, a, a very important area where the idea was at the time uh, we now uh, got to find molecules better, smaller, that can make better drugs. And, uh, uh, but this idea was still somehow uh, related to blocking uh, proteins. And then this idea of bringing proteins together uh, such that then uh, this could endow new function to them, for example, degrading the protein, was one that fascinated me for a very long time. And, uh, uh, and applying the principles of fragments to this idea has allowed uh, my lab and others uh, to uh, develop some remarkable progress in this area. For example, developing really important small molecules that can now allow us to go all the way through uh, and, uh, uh, and improve how these molecules uh, function. Uh, so uh, so the, um, the molecular recognition is, is really something that, uh, in my opinion, uh, now provides an opportunity to drug the undruggable. Because if we can find binders to these proteins, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Craig and I are going to proteins to degrade them. Uh, we have Jennifer here who is going to tell us about RNA. But nevertheless, this idea of binding is, is one that uh, will, will, will always be there for, a, for a, an agent to then impact onto the biology. But then binding doesn't just lead to inhibition. Then binding can endow new function or shut down things as well as perhaps activate things. And so we're pursuing these ideas in the laboratory in many directions, 
uh, including notably person degradation, and I'd be delighted to talk more about that. Thank you. So let's uh, try to get through the, um, the ribosomes and to the RNA community here, Jennifer. So um, I also am a chemist by training, actually up the street here at Columbia University. Um, had a brief academic career, moved to industry, at, well, what, what the time was Sando, now of course is Novartis, um, and then at Biogen. And what I will say is that well, what was the stark difference between the academics and the, and the industry was that much of the insight in the industry that I had to that day was about taking biology concepts and then finding molecules that in essence serve the interests of the biology. And this is good, honest work. However, uh, I was really more hungry for the situations where the chemistry would drive opportunity that would lead ultimately to new biology. Um, and so in 2005, uh, left and went to Mersana Therapeutics, making novel um, complex molecules there. And then to Avila Therapeutics, where we made covalent inhibitors and found biologies that benefited from that. And we got bought by Celgene. I found myself at Celgene as the VP of Chemistry. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, but I was jetting across the country constantly to run the various groups that I had been re responsible for. And my kids were old enough to know I was missing and young enough to care. Um, so, and I live in Hollywood. I live in the Boston area. There's a wonderful new company every six weeks there. And so I explained to my superiors that it was time for me to look for something else. And so in 2015, I was um, expecting to wander around looking for something new. Went to a Gordon conference, saw people, academics, talking about making small molecules bind to RNA. And I felt like I had not gotten the email. So um, I said, I, want, I was looking for something to do. I want to do that. And so I found um, friendly VCs that I knew uh, from previous relationships who were also very interested in this problem. And very quickly, we put together a company uh, called Arrakis Therapeutics, um, and um, where I uh, had the pleasure of being employee one, which is as different from employee 10 as it is 10 is from 100. Um, and so uh, we wanted to tackle this problem. How could we make molecules that were orally available and very drug-like uh, and yet bound to RNA and therefore interdicted the normal career of that RNA and the biology that ensues from that? Um, and I'll talk more about that in a, in a few minutes. But that's how we got started. That's how I got into this field. So Karen, leading one of the most experienced and, and largest global chemistry department, what made you put resources on this speculative field instead of going for the more precedented uh, programs? I think uh, the short answer is history. Over my more than 20 years in pharmaceutical research, I've uh, seen the constant theme of how we can get to robust clinical efficacy in areas of unmet medical need. And while there are many aspects to this, one aspect very appealing to a chemist is to really go after those targets that are highly disease relevant, even if they are difficult to drug. Our job to uh, drug the undruggable, make it uh, druggable. And uh, what are undruggable targets or difficult to drug targets? They are targets which very often have very shallow pockets, binding pockets. They are highly flexible. And even if we find binders, it doesn't mean that they are functional. We have made quite remarkable progress over the years, and I think recent successes like the KRAS uh, 12C inhibitors that have entered the clinic are a good example, or our own SHIP2 phosphatase inhibitor. These are often highly engineered answers that are very special to the targeted protein and uh, quite a bit of work of art. The interesting aspect is that combining this with the technology advances, cryo-EM, but then also DNA-encoded libraries where we can get very quickly to binders for many pockets of targets we are interested in, and then bringing this together with, for example, the targeted protein uh, degradation technology, we found there is a real opportunity to get a more general approach to these difficult targets. And uh, it's exciting to see now how these uh, constructs are going into the clinic and we'll learn much more because there is, of course, the other questions, safety, the selectivity in cellular context. But um, I'm really passionate about 
bringing the science to the to the patient as quickly as possible, and I think it takes uh, the whole scientific community for it. Thank you, and maybe Michael, a strategic view. The balance between expanding established modalities such as small molecules and moving into novel modalities, cell and genes. What you're thinking about that in? Yeah, I mean, so, so Michael Ringel, I'm a managing director, senior partner at BCG, been with the firm uh, just over 20 years, uh, background as a, a PhD in biology. And, uh, you know, I've spent my career, as you said, on thinking about R&D productivity and how does this industry bring more value to patients for a given amount of R&D. Uh, and there are a lot of facets to that question, actually. There's operational aspects. There are um, human behavioral ones. There are strategic choices. Um, but there are also these scientific and technical choices that we have to make. And there's incredible complexity, as I think you were alluding to. Um, there's something like 10 to the 6, 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6 different possible targets uh, if you, you know, to modulate biology within the cell. Um, you know, it's 20,000 genes, there's the whole transcriptome, the whole proteome, the whole metabolome. Those are just the genes. There's all the gene regulatory regions, 200,000 of those maybe, which we don't really understand. And so this incredible complexity of biology of what you might modulate to affect disease. And then you couple it with this incredible complexity of, of chemistry, and I use chemistry in the broad sense, not just small molecule chemistry, but all these modalities. Even within small molecules, uh, it's been calculated there's something like 10 to the 60th different combinations, shapes that you can make that are below a molecular weight that, that, that would you know, match what a medicine looks like. Uh, 10 to the 60th is the same as the number of atoms there are in the solar system. <laughs> it's a big number. Uh, and so this incredible complexity of possible ways then to modulate you know, all these different things you might want to modulate, figuring out what the right combination is is an incredible challenge for the industry. And so I, I have a lot of passion around that intellectual question. Um, and then you know, it always translates back. And one of the great things about this industry is that it, it always translates back to impact for patients and, and driving value. So it's, a, I think, a great industry to be in because it's, it's this combination of incredible intellectual challenge and incredible value that you can drive. Thank you very much. So I'll direct one more drill down question to each of the panel members. And after that, uh, a great opportunity for all of you here to raise questions. So use the time to think about what is your question that you really would like to have answered here. So I'll go back and start with, uh, on the left side, Craig here. Uh, you know, the term Protex has emerged as an uh, example of one drug class within protein degraders. Could you give us a little bit insight into some of the Protex that you're working on? And, and I know that you actually recently shared some early clinical data that I, I thought was intriguing in the sense that these molecules are large, small molecules often. And uh, the, one of the questions was, how will they be, um, we, what will be the bioavailability and exposure of them in humans? Because they go beyond what was called uh, the Lipinski rules of drug-friendly molecules. And as you share those data, give a little bit of a hint what you're working on as a next wave of opportunity. Sure. So some of the advantages and, and, and the challenges of, of Protax are actually in their design, right? So these are hetero bifunctional molecules. Uh, one end, the warhead that binds the target protein, the other end binds uh, an E3 ligase, part of the quality control machinery. And by inducing the proximity of these two proteins, we can now tag th these proteins to be destroyed. Um, and so what we've been able to do is, uh, in a ser series of proof of concept experiments, recruit kinases, uh, nuclear hormone receptors, epigenic readers, cytosolic proteins, receptor tyrosine kinases. We can degrade these proteins, but we've been using off-the-shelf ligands. And likewise, on the other side, uh, we have developed uh, and, and exploited a very small number of ligands for E3 ligases, a handful or, few, or fewer. And so, you know, I think that the, the big challenge uh, for the field is going to be innovation on both ends. You know, if, if you think about the undruggable proteins, these, by definition, don't have active sites. These are scaffolding proteins. These are transcription factors. These are regulatory proteins that function simply by being. 
And to now address that function, you got to make them not be. You need to destroy them, right? And so, uh, but, but the question is, how do you do that? And so uh, Karen mentioned uh, DNA encoded libraries. Uh, these Dell-based uh, uh, technologies are, are one example of uh, new emerging technologies that are going to be very powerful in terms of identifying compounds that simply bind as opposed to, to inhibit. And that's a real departure from the traditional high throughput sequencing uh, screening technologies that have been based on uh, enzymatic inhibition. Uh, inhibition. Fortunately, things like the, the Dell technology, uh, these technologies are becoming more like commodities, right? They're, they're now becoming more available, more affordable to small biopharmers and even to academic labs. And I think that's going to spur in innovation even more. And on the other end, right, so I just talked about targets, um, warheads for the targets. We need more E3 ligase ligands. Well, there are over 600 different E3 ligases. Uh, by some estimates, um, there are many that are tissue-specific and even disease-specific. So you can imagine that instead of designing a protac that will de uh, degrade a selectively a, a oncoprotein, and you get your selectivity based on this interaction. If you have an E3 ligase interacting ligand that only engages an E3 ligase that's expressed, say, in tumor cells, you could degrade histones, right? You could degrade something essential for life, and that would not occur outside of, of the tumor or the diseased tissue because that E3 ligase wouldn't be there. So it, it would completely change uh, the dynamic. And so, to answer your question, I think that the, the key is going to be innovation in ligand discovery on both ends of this heterobifunctional molecule. And uh, Craig, I think your first efforts uh, included um, targets like the hormone receptors, the androgen receptor in prostate as one example, where of course there are ligands, but you were thinking, can I degrade the receptor and what would that mean for cancer patients? And I, I know from the field that some of the molecules are much larger than the traditional androgen receptor uh, binders. So what, what are your initial learnings when you expose those to humans? Were you feeling that you could uh, achieve uh, low, medium, high bioavailability? Were you surprised about the data? <laughs> I was just surprised about the data. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we're so general, I'm trying <laughs> to extract for the benefit of the audience more detailed knowledge about the field here. We were very fortunate that, that the, the preclinical data were, were quite supportive of us obviously moving in, into human clinical trials. So we had a good sense of how these molecules, and, and you're right, they are much larger than your traditional um, small molecules. Um, but we had a good sense of, of how they behaved in both rodents and, and, and non-rodents. Uh, and so we were uh, optimistic. And the data that was just reported yesterday uh, sort of um, confirms that they're, they're safe, um, that they have uh, uh, favorable tolerability, uh, and as well as favorable PK. And so we hope that in the next uh, 6 to 12 months we'll be able to report on the efficacy. But but um, the bottom line is I think that these molecules, despite their size, are behaving like traditional drugs. Thank you. So unless you, on one hand, we start to gain more structural insights into these ternary complexes. And Craig spoke about that you can use ligases that directs you to different tissues depending on what diseases you are going for. So as you're thinking about the advances you are doing in your lab, where will that take you in... Um, what type of disease-like proteins and what tissues would be the national, ra rational for you to go into? And, you know, given that this is a new drug class, as we hope to make an impact on diseases, possibly cancer, do you think we'll encounter completely new patterns of resistance than what we have seen with um, target-binding uh, antagonists? Sure. Uh, so, uh, you, you, I'd just like to start by saying that you mentioned the new target class, new compounds class, and I think uh, we, we, we've we got to go measure these things and learn as we go along. Uh, I, I'd just like to tag on what just Craig said in terms of were you surprised, and I think uh, uh, personally I must say when I, I, I got, uh, you know, I've always believed in this, Craig's always believed in this, but when I started my own lab and I was asked, uh, you know, why are you, start, why are you working on these things, Protax, you know, the, 
they're too big, they'll never work. And, uh, you know, we believed in this and we stuck to this. And maybe just a piece of advice to the audience, you know, if everyone, if you have an idea and somebody tells you why are you working on this, it's never going to work. That's actually probably the right reason to stick with it and work on it, okay? <laughs> Uh, I'll just take that parenthesis. But uh, um, I'd just like to, to mention, uh, to go back to your comment about the, uh, uh, the structural uh, work. So we were very fortunate to, to solve the uh, crystal structure of an uh, absolutely key ternary complex of, of, of how proteins bring together a target and a ligase. And that has, uh, has been a, a fascinating discovery. It's, it's opened a, a lot of understanding about how these proteins work. You know, our conventional wisdom was, uh, you know, as Craig mentioned, you have these three parts, and the linker just needed to somehow to sort of bridge them. Uh, what we learned is that these, these two proteins come together, and, and they, uh, they intimately interact, and we can form very stable complexes. And, and this goes then back, relates back absolutely critically to the mode of action of how these things work, to the mechanism. And, uh, and this is really important, and why is this important? Because if we understand these things better, then we can uh, more rationally go after the, bi the right biology, and, uh, and that is emerging, and it's emerging at an increasingly fast pace. You know, the, the way we're learning about which target we should go after, indeed, which target we should not go after, right, it's increasing at exponential rate. But the, the way our chemistry has sort of tapped into that has not followed up. And now if we understand how to do this, we can do this better. And particularly, uh, and this is an area that is very close to me, um, if we can see it, we can design it better because uh, we can understand the structure, et cetera. And I think that uh, uh, I'd like to go in, uh, you know, uh, in the direction of your questions. There are, I think there are three areas that are important. When we talk about uh, the sort of targeting the undruggables, and again, what does undruggable mean? It means it hasn't been drugged yet until today, right? And so, um, uh, so uh, often uh, we're aware that one of the reasons these things are undruggable beyond the biology or the disease is merely the fact that we cannot get very potent high affinity compound. But now that we are understanding how to degrade and how this works, perhaps we can leverage in much weaker affinities. And again, that is another dogma. You know, we mentioned the rule of five. That is a, a kind of guideline dogma that has been sitting with us for many, many years. But one of the dogma in the industry and in the, in the, among chemists is people just don't like to work with things that are weak, right? So everybody likes to work with things that are potent, picomolar, nanomolar. But, you know, I trained in studying things that bind millimolar, and I learned very early on that even from something weak, you can build something that is very specific and very effective. So I think that is one way to go after the undruggable. I think um, the other point that you mentioned, which is tapping new biology, I think the excitement that we have now is, uh, as Craig and I and others in the, now around the world, develop high-quality compounds. We can now degrade a protein within half an hour, within 10 minutes. Now think about that. That could not have been possible 10 years ago. And that is not possible by any means with other approaches, with other tools. So that allows probing fast biology, probing acute responses without allowing the cells and the tissues perhaps to uh, kind of accommodate and, 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 pheno and you know, change phenotype. And finally, I think resistance is early days. Um, Ultimately, uh, whenever we develop drugs, I think the, uh, the disease will always fight back and there will always be mechanism to find a resistance to our pharmacological intervention. Some of these will be biological rewiring. Some of these will just be related to the mechanistic uh, uh, modality that we're using. So I think it's early days, but uh, I'll be welcome to, uh, to, uh, to answer questions here. But I think I'd like to make two key points, and I think that uh, degraders are new modality. It's a new modality that we didn't have before in hand. And hence, uh, I think that uh, 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 potentially there's an opportunity to overcome resistance by simply learning how the new modality could be advantageous and differentiate. Thank you. So Jennifer, as you told us how you decided with passion to embark on the small molecule mRNA field, and we touched briefly here on the decades of advancement in dealing with proteins were um, structural guided drug design, rules of drug friendliness were so helpful. You have to write that textbook yourself. <laughs> Open up a few chapters and share with us where you are and how does these compounds really look like? So, um, 
sort of broadly to, to one of your points, I, I think when we initially got started, we thought it might just be <clears throat> we'd have to tweak a few methods and we'd be on our way. Um, it's sort of like flipping a house, right? Um, it turned out it was a teardown. Um, and we've had to really reconstruct. It's, it's sort of like being tossed maybe on a, on a desert island, having to reconstruct the drug industry ex nihilo. So, um, and so this goes with uh, target ID, uh, understanding structure from sequence, understanding which structures are functional, understanding whether those structures, in fact, have uh, pockets, whether those pockets are functionally interesting, uh, et cetera, right through um, uh, the entire value chain. So, um, so we, we got started, okay? So first of all, what's the, what's the drive? I mean, why would you take on something so daunting? And that is that, as uh, Michael pointed out a moment ago, the number of possible targets is positively staggering. Um, you know, somewhere in the 10 to the 5th, you know, multiple 10 to the 5th possible targets. Now, I will point out that many of these targets are extremely unvalidated and therefore perhaps not the best targets for a small company, so we focus on things that are more validated. Uh, but the opportunity is out there if you can crack the problem of drugging RNA. Secondly, where are your targets? So you have to find uh, your targets from a sequence perspective. Uh, and I can tell you that the databases you're using are a general, let's be charitable and say, inadequately curated. Um, so you have to find your targets, demonstrate that they are there. Uh, then, of course, you have to find structure. I can assure you that basically 85% of RNA that is transcribed has complex three-dimensional structure, which is lovely, but you have to find which of these structures, in fact, you can reconstitute in a stable form and screen, but also how biologically significant. Uh, and so we had to, in essence, uh, take that perspective. So much of what we have done that's innovative has to do with the RNA itself, the target. All right? Now, in contrast with the small molecules, we are strongly committed to having the small molecule be as profoundly, staggeringly boring as possible. Right? So uh, we have found ligands that bind to every single RNA substructure that we have screened. Right? And that's now in the dozens. So it is possible to screen these structures and find ligands that bind to them in the single digit to sub-micromolar region. Um, and that uh, they are also selective right, for that particular RNA. Uh, if, it's, if, it's, if it binds to three or, or more RNAs, we're like, this is a waste of time. We have plenty of other lovely selective molecules. But I should emphasize that these molecules, if you've read the RNA literature and looked at the kinds of molecules that come out of largely academic labs um, that bind to RNA in those publications, you will find them to be, well, if you're used to looking at good drugs, you'll find them to be disturbing um, and really discouraging. Our molecules are, and this is a little old school, but our molecules are pretty much uniformly uh, rule of five Lipinski compliant. All right? Um, now, part of that's because that's what we put into the libraries. Right? So we really want them to look at those. Um, if what you need is you need a molecule which is poorly distributed, uh, has to be delivered parenterally, uh, et cetera, someone, like, go down the street, and Lylan will take care of you. They got you all set up. You're going to be fine. Um, so we absolutely have to have molecules that we think are going to be orally available, well distributed, uh, that have all the usual problems of small molecules, but ones that we're familiar with. Um, you know, so um, from a design perspective, we haven't yet got to the point where we can do, you know, atom level uh, structure-based drug design, and that is sort of the next wave of innovation for us. What, but um, what type of targets do you think you or other uh, peers to you will uh, move forward as the first wave of potential breakthroughs and what disease is? For us, it's messenger RNA. Um, but what do they encode for? That's so general. Um, I would be, let's just say, let's just say there's the usual rogues gallery yeah. of targets that are largely considered undruggable. The one we've been fairly open about is MYC. Um, I personally think that MYC is, is fundamentally at the protein level pretty undruggable. There may be, of course, uh, dissenting opinions to my left. Uh, but I think it's a pretty undruggable. I figure it's got to be easier to drug that RNA that makes MYC than it is to drug MYC. 
right? So that's kind of the rationale for going after targets of this sort. And so if you just go down our list of targets, they are, again, one high value target after the other um, that no one has been able to drug, and they're not going to be drugged by, um, by going after the protein with small molecules, at least not readily. They're not going to be drugged by going after biologics. Um, and because they're going to be largely inside solid tumors, in many cases we are very interested in oncology, uh, you will find that um, you really can't even really go after them with, um, with uh, oligos. So it really sort of falls to us to, to, to go after those. Uh, I should say all of biology, I mean, RNA is upstream of all of biology. So there's no, there's no therapeutic area which we couldn't conceivably address. But uh, we are, uh, of course, currently focused on rare diseases and uh, oncology targets. Um, and then finally, I would say the mechanisms of action that we can go after are really quite extensive because the regulatory, you can go after the 5' UTR, which of course you develop, you re regulate translation. You can go after the ORFs. You can go after splicing. We can go after the 3' UTR and regulate whether or not the RNA will survive. Um, so there's really an enormous range, not just of, of targets, but of the ways in which we can address those targets. Thank you, Karen. Um, when, when you um advance your efforts into this field, what's the proper balance between developing unique chemical classes and collaborating with these type of companies? Indeed, this is a very important question and overall we always like to look for complementarity and adjacency. Complementarity in the sense that um, getting access as quickly as possible to new technologies and being able to work with the inventor, inventors, why would we want to build that ourselves? Really, I, what we can bring there, we can really bring uh, the best combination, bringing our drug discovery experience and also help with our target selection and uh, what are the different targets we want to go after first. The adjacency in the sense that we often have small internal groups, uh, like for example, we have a new modalities group really looking into how we can track some of these difficult to track targets. And they then often find also these technologies on the outside inventors quick, uh, quickly and they can then have that knowledge in-house to complement and work together with our uh, external partners and perhaps even expand the scope. Overall, I think we can't do everything internally. There are so many different disease areas where we are working with, uh, with in uh, pharmaceutical companies that it's important that we take advantage of uh, the invention outside. There's creativity, which you can never replicate all in-house. But there is also disease areas that perhaps might have less of these opportunities with outside research and we then focus our internal resources on. We have a Novartis, an additional program that is called the uh, Novartis uh, Faculty of Scholars Initiative. And what that does, that brings uh, in that really early sense of research when it's really risky, but one of uh, the academic researchers with their deep knowledge and big <laughs> ideas would like to have access to a track discovery lab. We connect them and work together and learn together on very early efforts and make perhaps even efforts possible that otherwise wouldn't happen. The, uh, and overall, I think that's probably the nice balance to have. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we, we heard a little bit that uh, our efforts to uh, knock down through products, proteins, maybe like the androgen receptor in prostate and see if we can um, avoid some of the resistance mechanisms seen today. We heard Jennifer speak about uh, MUC-dependent cancer, which is uh, one of the common genes originally defined in lymphomas, but play a role in many cancers. Patients that get the gene sequencing from, from Deutsche Medicine or some other centers and have a MUC-activated pathway <laughs> would certainly be welcoming to see um, an mRNA-acting drug as one option to make it uh, actionable. As these things advance, do you think the initial wave will actually help to improve R&D productivity, or will it be an initial dip because it's so resource-consuming, and we may even see late-stage failures from unexpected yeah. safety before we can reap the benefit? What's your prediction here? 
Okay, so, to, so to answer that, we have to talk about the drivers of R&D productivity. Um, and actually, let me first define R&D productivity. Uh, so uh, I'll define it as the amount of value created for patients per unit of input of R&D invested, so per dollar of R&D. Um, and unfortunately, we've had a phenomenon in biopharmaceutical R&D called E-Room's Law. Uh, let me just show a hand. Who, who has heard of E-Room's Law? <laughs> Not many. Um, uh, E-Room's e Law stands, unfortunately, for Moore's Law in reverse. <laughs> uh, so many people have heard of Moore's Law, computing power doubles every two years. Um, E-Room's Law, unfortunately, is that for 50 years, the productivity of R&D has halved every six years. Um, and you add that up over 50 years, that's, um, that's starting down a bad path. <laughs> um, and we understand a little bit about what's driving that. So um, the, the proximate cause is a massive increase in failure rate. Uh, so um, even from the, the sort of data point that people use, even from the start of development, which is when you're in, in testing in humans, and there's a whole period before this of research and preclinical where there's lots of failure as well. But even from development, people would say, you know, more than 90% fail. Um, if you look at the real data, it was more than 95% failed, and it was increasing. Um, and it was largely driven by just our lack of understanding of biology. We were going after targets that we had a hypothesis around, and it didn't pan out. Um, you know, the good news is, actually, over the last decade, E-Room's law has turned around. No, we're not even not declining anymore, uh, but we're actually increasing a little bit. And is it Moore's law now again? Or? <laughs> it's not Moore's law. It's just over flat. <laughs> so, uh, but but it, it's, it's largely because uh, success rates have recovered, so actually now fewer than 90% fail. Um, and that, you know, if you look underneath it, there's signals that that is really driven by better understanding of biology. We have new tools around omics, the human genome. You know, one genome doesn't help you a lot, but now we have these genome-wide associational studies. You can compare a bunch of people with a disease versus a bunch of controls, get a clue around the biology. And we have a set of other tools that also help us understand you know, from human biology what the right targets are. And that's largely been the driver. So this story has largely been around biology, not chemistry. Um, the way chemistry, I think, comes into play is that, okay, much of the reason why we've gone after the wrong targets has been just, you know, we tried and we had a hypothesis that didn't work out. But part of it is, you know, <laughs> we made the point earlier, we, you know, it's like the analogy of looking for your car keys under the street lamp. Uh, you know, it's the easy place to look. And we've definitely gone after targets that have been the easy target, and that has been part of the causality of, of some of this decline. And so as we get these new modalities that allow us to be much more agnostic about what the target we go after, it should, it should improve. Yes, there's a, there, I, I do believe there is a little bit of an investment period where it depresses somewhat, but I think overall, you know, we're not going to see that in the signal of, of Elam's law. And maybe just one, I, I'm triggering off the, the point around transcription factors earlier, and, and also your point around how much of the biology we don't know. Um, so that there's a group called the Illuminating the Human Genome, or the, the Druggable Genome Project, and they looked at you know 20,000 different targets, uh, basically the whole you know the whole set at least the, of the genes, and um, it, it, clearly what you know their main finding was just how little we know about the biology. Uh, so fully a third, there was literally nothing at all in any literature, in any database about the targets. Um, and then for the vast majority of the remainder, we knew almost nothing. <laughs> um, so there's clearly a big uh, biology gap. Um, but they also it illuminated uh, you know, a chemistry gap, which is uh, in that set, there were 1,500 transcription factors. Um, that's as many targets as there are of G protein coupled receptors, ion channels, kinases. Um, roughly this, you know, 1,500 of each of those, 50% um, of all drugs on market are in those latter three. Zero drugs on market are <laughs> target transcription factors today. So we've clearly been biasing you know, where our energy goes based on what drug, transcription factors are very hard to drug because they're in the nucleus, they're you know, hard, generally in the nucleus, hard to reach. Um, so we've clearly been biasing based on what you can reach versus not. And to the extent we can be much more flexible around where we go, Okay, it's not always a problem that we're picking, you know, these targets usually occur in pathways, right? The extracellular target triggers a kinase, triggers a transcription factor. So it can be okay to hit something that's upstream, and you may still end up with the same effect. 
but being able to be agnostic and actually pick really the best target obviously should help productivity, it should decrease that failure rate. So I think you get the sense this is a field with tremendous potential, but still obviously a lot of unknowns. And at Pfizer, we have tried to uh, advance our contribution here by both internally pursue um, novel chemistry here to generate um, improved components of the product, but also to collaborate with uh, these type of biotech companies. And I think when you bring together diverse learning, you really can make a leap. And that was an experience we had in gene therapy and here as well. Now it's an opportunity to ask questions. There are only good questions and uh, can only be bad answers, but no <laughs> bad questions. <laughs> we have a microphone there? Or? I can speak loudly. Okay. You want to start, Alessio? Uh, uh, well, I, I, can, I can comment here for sure. So thank you for the question. That's a great question. I think it's still early days, uh, but so far in terms of the fundamental uh, proof of concept studies uh, across a variety of different targets, we haven't been observing that. Um, and uh, one of the main reasons, uh, I think, uh, is that the cell has evolved an extremely uh, functional and, and a sort of high, bu highly buffering uh, uh, degradation machinery. And so what we are doing with this protex is we're hijacking or co-opting, if you wish, a very small percentage, a very tiny percentage. That still allows us to degrade the target protein that we want to do so very, very quickly without impinge on the natural function of a cell. So this is basically what we are currently observing. Um, uh, but of course, um, there's always room for exceptions. And different diseases are known, uh, and different cellular states are known to be dependent on, on protein quality control and protein degradation to a varying degree. So it'll be important to watch out for this. It's a very important point. Other questions here of curiosity? Excellent. You have to shout. I don't know what happened with the microphone here. Sorry for that. Uh, organizers, you have a microphone? Circle around? Or? <laughs> All right, shout. OK, I'm Viviana. I'm a uh, I work uh, at NYU. I'm a postdoc. Uh, and uh, I have a question for Jennifer Keller. So uh, targeting mRNA is very different than targeting proteins, right? So. What are the challenges to, like, detect biochemicals? You should target these drugs, and these, uh, these molecules, and uh, at what point we are now? And uh, if you found uh, uh, hurdles in the getting funded, for example, if people in the field uh, were saying, no, oh, this is not going to work. <laughs> Uh, so yes, there were quite a few people who said, no, this will not work. Um, some of them, in fact, were less charitable than that. Um, so, um, but there were a few people who appreciated the prospect for success and the, the, the pull, in essence, of the opportunity. Aside from the things that I've already mentioned, maybe one particular challenge is it's worth remembering that although we find that when you look at the structures as best you can, of folded regions in a messenger RNA, you find pockets. But we are not under the impression that those pockets, even though small molecule compatible, that those pockets have any adaptive significance. In other words, we don't believe that those pockets are evolved or conserved. The three-dimensional structure is often conserved from the standpoint of the sort of the functional requirements of the RNA, but the pocket we believe to be a com completely an epiphenomenon. Um, and so we suspect that to the extent that we find molecules that bind to them and alter the biology, that that also is adventitious, okay? So um, 
So there is a challenge in translating what has been a high success in ligand ability to then going into biology and showing a consistently, you know, which pockets that you bind to actually produce some change that you think is advantageous. And that's, we're very much in the thick of that battle right now. And we have some wins, but it's a, it's a, it's a battle. Jennifer, you mentioned uh, also rare disease as an area for yeah. RNA um, acting small molecules. Could, could you exemplify activities going on in that space? Because I, I think there are a couple of drugs that have come out, probably more on the splicing part. Right. So, um, probably can't talk about specific targets in this venue, but I, what I can tell you is that, so we were very inspired by the work that uh, was done by Novartis and the Roche-BTC collaboration in the area of SMA. The distinction we would make is that we have uh, largely avoided a phenotypic approach. We want to take a very structure-driven, intentional approach going after RNA structures, um, which brings advantages and, and, and challenges. But as we look at uh, rare disease, the one categorical comment I'll offer is that um, we cannot replace your protein, right? In other words, if you have um, a stop codon in the wrong place, we can't fix that for you. Uh, if there's a splicing problem, we may be able to, in fact, sort of patch things together by altering the splicing pattern. So there are splicing mechanisms of action that are of interest to us. Also, um, there is a whole category of rare diseases called haploinsufficiency diseases, which are fascinating because um, you, there are mechanisms, such as in the 3' UTR, where you can imagine um, elevating the level of the RNA, which in many cases will elevate the degree of expression of the protein that it makes. And the beauty of the haploinsufficiency disease is that pathology traces to only a 50% level of expression, and that all you need to do is get it up, you know, at most twofold, maybe 1.5-fold to see therapeutic benefit, at least in theory. All right? So um, these are targets that interest us rather considerably. And what's amusing is that some of those targets are, in fact, oncogenes, where if you have only 50% of your oncogenes in the wild type, you have a disease. Uh, Thank you. I think it sounds fascinating that um, maybe in a decade there will not be a single oncogene that we wouldn't be able to drag by combining the established approaches with um, targeting them at the RNA or using Protex. Um, and we may even be able to do it with some cell specificity, uh, particularly on the Protex, by tapping into uh, different uh, ligases, those that direct the protein for destruction, that are tissue specific. So I'm, I just wanted to give a sense how this field could be transformed completely by bringing together different drug types. And are the disease that you want to cure and I uh, want to ask the panel uh, how and when? <laughs> May, great. Uh, now we got the microphone moving. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, Craig, uh, you recently went public. Um, this is a very complicated um, subject that we're engaging in here. I'd be intrigued from your roadshow. What were the key kinds of things that investors asked you? Because most, most people in the financial community, unlike colleagues at Big Pharma, um, wouldn't have a clue about this. Or I might add about, about what you're doing in RNA. Right, so, so the, it's a new modality, right? And, and so there's skepticism, and, and I get that. Um, th there are opportunities, however. And so let me just point out one that I think is, is, is quite interesting, and, and this disconnect, potential disconnect, between the traditional PK and PD relationships. Normally, to get a clinical benefit, you need to have a nice uh, drug exposure. But because we're working with a catalytic uh, mechanism, um, we've been able to show in preclinical models whereby a single dose, uh, you get a nice Cmax, you can clear out the vast majority of that protein population. And depending on the resynthesis rate of the target, you might not be able to detect days later the drug in the serum. But you're still having enough of the protac degrading the residual amount that is trying to be made. And, and we know that, and this can go out a week or more. And we know that because if you now come in with an, a uh, competitive inhibitor of one, right, to block that ternary complex that Alessio discussed, 
up pops the target protein again. So we knew there, there has to be residual uh, protec in there. So I think that, that there are opportunities in there. We don't know all of the rules yet, um, but because it's new, there were questions. Just a follow-on question, because I find, because um, I'm a financial person, I find investors are almost bipolar on the subject of new mechanisms of action. Everybody wants them until they think about that. Okay, so what did you find among the investors you saw in your roadshow in that regard? I would probably say it fell into two camps, as you can imagine. Uh, th there were people that were more risk tolerant, that could see the, the potential in this, could see the, the impact it could have on, on many different indications. Um, and then there were others that were saying, okay, that might happen, but let's let someone else put their money at risk. Thank you. So we'll end with a kind of speed uh, conversation here. I'll ask each panel member with just a few words to exemplify if we were sitting here again 2025, what would be the most intriguing headline coming from your field? I didn't say your company to avoid that you would be concerned about speaking about proprietary things. So feel protected by the statement, it's from the field, and think big. Start with Jennifer here. Oh. We're, not, we're out of order. This is <laughs> <laughs> so um, there are a few things that need to be happening in the next few five years. One is that the degree of validation, the notion that you can much like we have done for many decades with proteins, that you can go from an RNA sequence to a structure, to a ligand, to biology, to, uh, a clinically, to clinical outcomes that are positive, therapeutic benefit. Um, this, to do this fairly routinely now would be the big uh, headline, I think, in five years. And then what that would do, and maybe for a broader audience, is that would say, wow, we've really arrived. We can actually now add RNAs to the list of targets that we have to seriously consider every time we want to go after a particular pathology. Thank you. I, I think we need some stronger headlines. We wouldn't sell uh, another extra paper <laughs> in New York Times with that headline. Bless you. Think like a journalist now. I'm more of a scientist. I'm sorry. Give us some scientific <laughs> breakthroughs, 2025. Well, what disease will you cure? Well, 20, 20, well, I'm a chemist, so allow me to, uh, to, to maintain uh, the aspect of, of my answer uh, to, to the chemistry part. Uh, but I, I think that one of the things that PROTAC have broken through uh, is this realization, uh, two things. The realization that, uh, number one, bifunctional beyond rule of five molecules are drug-like and, and, and can be developed. And number two, this idea that we can now bring proteins together to endow new post-translational modification, new function that we could only dream of uh, prior to this. In fact, PROTAC glue these two proteins together. And if we can glue these proteins together mechanistically, we're, at the moment we're transferring ubiquity. Maybe we can transfer other post-translational modifications. Maybe we can erase other post-translational modification. Maybe we can take a protein to a different compartment of the cell. So I'm, I'm going to leave my answer there because I'm going to need you guys to tell me which diseases to go, okay. and then we can have a conversation. Okay? Okay. Uh, I, think, I think that's going to be, to me, the future of, of the area. And we recently wrote a review, a very interesting review about this, about how bifunctionals bring proteins together to induce protein-protein interaction that is uh, uh, hope, hopefully sort of guiding the field in that direction. Okay. It's really speed dating, so speed conversation. Craig, <laughs> one quick comment. I think that uh, five, six years from now, we hopefully will have some clinical validations of some of the diseases, uh, some of the modalities we talked about, and that will be what I would like to say is in the wild west of drug development in terms of a big rush for new drug, uh, drug targets. Uh, and one in particular that we haven't discussed here is neurodegeneration. The ability to, to address some of these protein aggregates, possibly through protein degradation, I think has a lot of potential. That sounds intriguing, and I think you're thinking about diseases driven by tau, Huntington, and those type of proteins. Um, please, Karen. We will have drug transcription factors, and we will take the concept of chemically induced proximity of proteins and biomolecules much further. The SMA molecules were mentioned. Those molecules binding RNA and protein together, it took some uh, insightful biological essays to do that, so chemistry, biology together, 
in the sense to make medical impact on first-in-class drugs. Uh, so I know we're in a, a little rush here. However, my, my headline is a four-part miniseries. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, you know, the vision for, I think, the future of, of R&D is, you know, step one, we, we have a much better understanding of biology through new tools, analytic tools, which we haven't really talked about. Step two, we have this chemistry armamentarium that allows us to hit any target we want to. Step three, we have model systems that allow us to iteratively test quickly with high fidelity that we trust the results in humans. And step four, we're able to find patients, measure their response, and actually deliver value in the clinic. So all of these are challenges, and, and the chemistry one is a key one, but I think we need to address all of them to really drive R&D. So I, I hope I can boost the uh, newspaper volume with a headline at the pre gallian 2025 panel, new combination therapy curing metastatic breast cancer and increasing survival of pancreatic cancer two years was revealed. I hope you enjoyed that uh, panel of today. And um, <laughs> of course, it was just an aspiration for 2025, but working together, we can turn dreams into reality. Thank you very much. <laughs>